Thank you, Donna. And uh, good morning, everybody. And I'd like to thank the Prince George Hospice Society for sponsoring this panel. You guys do good work. Thanks so much. Um, Michael Goring, President and CEO of the Mining Association. I'm not Kendra Johnson. Um, I'm pleased to be moderating the BC Natural Resources Forum Mining Panel. And it's a pleasure to be here back in beautiful northern British Columbia on the 20th anniversary of the BC Natural Resources Forum. And it's also a real pleasure to be here on the traditional unceded territory of the Clay Clay Tanay First Nation. And I'd like to thank Chief uh, Dolene Logan for her warm welcome uh, at the outset of the Natural Resources Forum the other night. <clears throat> Pardon me. This morning we're going to hear from, uh, hear the unique perspectives of four leaders who are joining us to discuss mining and Indigenous communities. And more specifically, as the title of this panel says, leaving a positive project legacy. Joining us today, from your left to right, are Peter Robb, Assistant Deputy Minister, the Mines Competitiveness and Authorizations Division of Energy Mines and Low Carbon Innovation. Naylene Morin, Vice President, Sustainability, Skeena Resources Limited. Charles Morvan, Secretary Treasurer of the Nishka Lissom's Government. And Christy Smith, Vice President, Indigenous and Stakeholder Relations, Falkirk Environmental Consulting. So for today's panel, each uh, panelist will make some brief opening remarks and then we'll transition into Q&A. Um, audience, if you have a question, use your Huba app and um, we'll uh, do our best to get to your questions as long as they're good. And, um, and I'll be the judge of that. Uh, our panel is timely and topical. I'm going to set a little context and then we're going to sit down and hear these people. Um, mining has recently taken center stage as the world has realized that minerals and metals are essential to the energy transition and our efforts to reach net zero by 2050. Minerals are now critical. I can use critical. In fact, some might say they're sexy. Well, us in the mining industry say that. Uh, in the last number of months, Ottawa has hosted numerous heads of state, including German Chancellor Schultz and the Prime Ministers of Japan and South Korea. Our abundant critical minerals and metals were on top of the agenda, and they'll be on the agenda when President Biden visits Ottawa in March. According to the International Energy Agency, we're going to need up to six times more minerals and metals by 2040 to accelerate the energy transition and meet the Paris Agreement's climate targets by 2050. That's six times. What's more, Canada and our allies now recognize we can no longer depend on Russia and China as suppliers and refiners of the critical minerals and metals we need to meet our climate targets and our defense and security objectives. BC Mining is well placed to help meet this surging global demand and this represents a generational opportunity for all British Columbians. Currently we have seven uh, new mines or mine extensions under consideration in BC. Together they represent four billion in capex, 6,400 new construction and operating jobs, new indigenous partnerships and opportunities and an economic impact somewhere in the range of 10 billion. There are 10 other medium-term critical mineral projects in the pipeline that will produce copper, copper gold, along with the world's largest unmined niobium deposit and two world-class nickel deposits. The key common denominator and the critical success factor across all of these projects is or will be a solid level of Indigenous participation, partnership, including equity participation. Prior to the Declaration Act, BC Mines played an important leadership role in advancing economic reconciliation with our Indigenous partners through numerous IBAs, partnerships, and other collaborative efforts. 
Our members are significant partners with indigenous businesses to the tune of more than 265 million a year. Mines are the largest private sector employer of indigenous people in Canada. And we're the first sector where the province and indigenous nations enter into resource sharing, uh, resource revenue sharing agreements. These are important steps in economic reconciliation. And as Naylene mentioned earlier, we have come a long way. But there's more to do. In fact, today in 2023, consultation, accommodation, and impact benefit agreements are a baseline expectation. With the Declaration Act and its requirement for FPIC, we've transitioned from tra transactional relations to consent-based shared decision-making, and rightly so. It won't always be easy, but our members are up for it, as are our partners. And I think at this moment it's incumbent upon me, before I turn it to the panel, to say there's a place place for both the province and the federal governments to step up and continue to empower Indigenous peoples to participate in natural resource development and advance economic reconciliation. Our members are keen to see both levels of government work together to assist Indigenous governing bodies on their terms with the governance, administrative and technical capacity needed to participate on an equitable footing in government-to-government and shared decision-making processes. As well, federal authorities would do well to identify the necessary financial instruments and expedite equity participation for Indigenous nations in mines and other natural resource projects. And our members at MABC call on the province to ensure nations receive a sustainable share of mineral tax revenue from the Crown under a revised fiscal framework. So I just thought I'd add that little bit of colour to our panel. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter Robb to begin our discussion, and then we will move down and end with Christy for introductory remarks. Thanks, Michael, and really appreciate um, the Click Like Today for hosting this event and allowing me to be on their territory today. And I also wanted to really acknowledge Jessica Wood, who couldn't make it today because she is sick, but if we want to talk about leaving a lasting legacy, she really pushed the Declaration Act through, and I think that that's a huge acknowledgement has to go to the work Jessica did and her team to really land that, that monumental agreement that I think re really is when we talk about legacy. Um, I, I've been in the mi mining industry for about 21 years, and it's a real honor to be up here with some of my colleagues and some of my mentors. I think Naylene has probably had lots of chances to talk over the last couple of days, but is an amazing woman who's done some really amazing things both with her community and now with industry and so I did want to acknowledge her and take that time because I'm stepping out of the mining industry to try oil and gas after this but I, I think a lot of the same things I've learned here I'm gonna and talk about here are, are applicable across sectors I, I think for me the way I look back at my career and the way I look back at what mining has done for indigenous communities and the, the legacy hasn't been great uh, when I started there, there was a lot of you know, tough things left out there and tough conversations that really never, never happened. Um, and I, and I, I have been really lucky to see this curve and see this growth of what engagement, starting from consultation, which was a real tough word and probably not that effective in really understanding communities, to where we are now has been a phenomenal, phenomenal growth. And in 20 years to see what we've done and what we're doing and where we're going, you just feel really proud to get to be a part of it. And, and it is about getting ugly early, getting in, just being in community and having, having those honest conversations. I think that's what all of us have been able to have and been able to grow as, as colleagues and as friendships and all of those things is just getting in and being open and having that dialogue. I would say the exploration and mining sector has been a leader in that throughout the time I've been there. So first ever consultation agreement. So we we're trying to figure out what consultation was and the mining sector sat down with a little community that had a bunch of abandoned mines that didn't have a great history in their territory. We hammered out an agreement of what consultation or two governments starting to talk to each other looked like. Now those are commonplace. Forestry has them, mining has them, oil and gas has them. We just started a little community of less than 200 people. You know, the first strategic engagement agreement when we stopped saying, 
let's stop exchanging paper and having meetings and putting a checkbox. Let's get an agreement that is more strategic. What are the big things we want to try to achieve? First one we did was with Tunaha Nation, and now government does that as a fairly standard practice to, when you work with a nation, set out those big strategic pieces and get out of the weeds and figure out what those big interests are. Michael mentioned revenue sharing, so, you know, it, it, to get to reconciliation, you need a strong economic base, and, um, you know, DRIPA starts to talk about that, but long before that, I think the sector realized that if you're going to take those benefits from communities and, and try, to, try to spread them throughout the rest of the province, through healthcare and all those things, a portion of that needs to get back into nations and needs to be there for that base so they can start to make their own decisions on what reconciliation is and what their interests and needs are. So the mining sector was in BC was the first place to do that. And so, you know, and you just see that growth every year of those things happening. And the mining sector for me and the exploration guys, they never really complained. They were like, okay, let's do it. Let's figure out how to do it. And, and that's what I'm sort of most proud of. The nations turned and said, we have a lot of crappy history, but let's figure out what to do. And that was, that's been the really fun part. And that's why I've had great colleagues like uh, Naylene and, and lots of other people and Charles with where Nishka is starting to go. You know, and I just keep looking at that evolution. And we talked a little bit about section seven, but you know, Tall Tank gets a lot of play and press in the mining sector because they, they really are miners historically and they really are have charted a path for us for a bunch of rest of the communities to sort of learn. And I look at the relationship they're building with Nishka and mining, it's, it's really neat to see that. You get to where section seven is, like th that's a monumental shift. And who is the first to, when government was thinking, where do we do this? Where do we, where do we put consent in a big decision first? Mining was that place. So it, it gets a really hard rap for some of its history, but I would say, the efforts of the communities on both sides to really change that and to try to find new pathways has been an amazing journey to watch. And I think, as Michael said, we're at this place where British Columbia is the place to be. Um, I know Ontario and Quebec think they're the place to be and there's some other jurisdictions in the world that are pretty cool, but we have DRIPA. We have this act that nowhere else has and we're gonna find ways to do it and mining is gonna, and exploration is gonna lead that. We have clean electricity, you know, that, that's a huge check when you look at your ESG scores and you're trying to raise money out there. Uh, we don't have child labor, we don't have all these other things, and we have a, a willing workforce that is doing these big projects and being trained up and, 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 and is going to be ready to mo mobilize into some new projects. We haven't opened a new mine in British Columbia since 2016. I think I'm the, only, the longest running ADM to not actually open a mine. Uh, maybe that's why I'm being asked to move on, but, um, you know, I, I just think that there's a huge opportunity right now. Critical Minerals is real, um, and it is going to happen, and we, we need to capture that opportunity. So I probably talked for way too long, but that's part of what I always do. Thank you, Peter. Naylene. Just checking to see if this is on. <laughs> um, it's, it's always a privilege to, to sit on this stage. And when I, when I look out in and amongst the audience, I see a lot of colleagues and I see a lot of friends. And so it's, it's comforting to be here um, and to share with others, you know, the experiences that I've had um, working in the mining industry. And I just want to thank Peter. Um, we've had many, many interesting conversations uh, in the times that we've been working together to, you know, further develop um, Teltown's involvement in, in mining activity that happens in Teltown territory. But, you know, when I reflect on the word legacy, and I think about, you know, where I come from and the people that I come from, you know, the Teltown's mining experience it began thousands of years ago with the extraction, processing, and trading of obsidian. And, you know, some of the very first recorded gold rushes uh, in the north started in the 1800s, with, in the 1860s with, the, you know, the Stikin gold rush, in the 1870s with Cassiar. And, you know, so Telton have a lengthy, lengthy history have a legacy of mining. And, you know, even just for myself, of course, mine is far shorter, <laughs> but, 
But um, you know what? Mining put food on our table as a, ch as a child. That's, that's what I remember, right? My dad, he, uh, he has, um, he, he's retired, but you know, he, as a millwright, worked in a number of the mines up in northern BC. And you know, when I started my professional career, um, it was a natural fit for me to go into mining. You know, and some of the things that drive me and things that we see happening today, you know, the Taltan Nation had the foresight and the wherewithal to start thinking about these things in the early 2000s. And for those who are not familiar with this document, um, it's a report called Out of Respect, uh, which you can find online. And at that time, you know, they went through the exercise of asking themselves what were seven questions in the area of sustainability that covered engagement, people, environment, economy, traditional and non-market activities, institutional arrangements and governance, synthesis and continuous learning, right? So these are a lot of the things that we continue to talk about today. And, you know, I, I took a, a moment this morning at, uh, I don't know what it was, 5.30, <laughs> something like that, to, um, to review some of the material in there. And it always, you know, it, it just, I just find the whole thing so impressive because a lot of the actions that they had put into that document are things that we see not only the Taltan putting into place, but we see it across the industry right? Improved engagement, early engagement, right? Having uh, transparency, uh, working together in collaboration on, on, you know, projects between industry, indigenous nations, and government, right? Having, you know, management plans, having stewardship plans that were inclusive of, of you know, uh, Taltan interests and values for Taltans, having the capacity to be able to participate in, in the industry, not only in uh, labor positions, but in management positions as well. And so I, I just wanna take a moment to read a, a, a small um, excerpt from that document. In the future, the Taltan wish to be partners in development from a business perspective, in compliance and enforcement activities, in an overall management role, and from a decision-making perspective. So, what do you think, Peter? Oh, we seem to be doing check, okay. Check, check, check. <laughs> right? So this document is 20 years old, right? And these are things that we are working on doing today. Over the long term, the Taltan will work to build the skills and capacity that will allow them to participate directly and effectively in owning and operating mines, right? So over the last 20 years, uh, we've been involved in the development of a number and implementation of a number of impact benefit agreements that are now leading us to a place of more equity partnership, more co-management, and we are following a similar mindset with our work with the province as well. And it is that confidence in the work that we've been doing that led us to the first Section 7 agreement in the province of BC, of which we are very proud of. I want to take a moment now just to talk a little bit about my change in roles. You know, for me, um, being involved in the mining industry, it was always really important for me to bring my values, my mindset to, to the work that I do. And I always all, truly believed that Indigenous people have a role in resource development, in project planning. And so when I decided to go to school, I thought the best way for me to be able to, to do that would be to get an engineering degree, because I thought, you know, the engineers, they're the ones that plan these projects, they're the ones that design these projects, right? And so that's why I went into the field that I went into. But now when you look from that time period to today, you know, our project developments are not simply about dollars and cents. They're not simply about modeling. 
There are a number of other things that we take into consideration. There's a lot more work done towards environmental stewardship. There's a lot more consideration, not just for the science, but for the people, right? For the social aspects of, of these developments and what they bring, right? So now when we're doing this work, it's not just simply one specific team. It's a team with multiple disciplines of which I very much see Indigenous nations playing a role there. And super proud to be working with a company that has a similar mindset. So now when we sit at a table uh, representing, uh, you know, our, representing Skeena resources, we are bringing those values, those Taltan Nation interests. We're bringing that to the table because we're members of the Taltan Nation. So I'm going to leave it there and pass it to you, Charles. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and I'll try to use up the rest of our time. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, Thank you, and I uh, really appreciate the offer to be on this panel um, today and to give a little bit of insight to the work that I do for our Nishka Nation and working with the province of British Columbia and the mining companies in British Columbia and trying to attract investment to British Columbia. And having the ability to go to conferences such as the Precious Metals Conference in um, Colorado and talking with investors from all over the world and mining companies from all over the world and getting insight into what it is they are looking for in investment and what they ask for from mining companies and also getting to see how much actual mining exploration is going on in BC that affects a lot of our indigenous communities that they don't even know about. And so I think that uh, there, there's a lot of work left to do in regards to informing our indigenous communities as to what they have in their, their, uh, on their lands. And one of the reasons why I uh, am taking a great interest in this is because I know that the highest density of minerals is in our nation's lands and the Taltan. It's the highest density anywhere in the world for minerals and that's why the Golden Triangle is so important to British Columbia. And as a treaty nation with our treaty partners of BC, working with them in all uh, levels of uh, what they're trying to do, like with the climate initiative, we're working closely with them on that to try to push uh, responsible development within British Columbia and bringing uh, an economy and a lot of revenue to British Columbia is important to us as a Nishka nation. And the Nishka nation just doesn't want to be a nation that's going to be signing impact benefit agreements. That, from my experience in Colorado and sharing with our nation, our nation doesn't just want to be one of those groups that just receives benefits from a benefit agreement. We want to be the ones that are going to be out there where mining companies are coming to us to ask us to invest in them. And that's one of the things that we're getting educated on in speaking with investment companies is to learn what they want to know to invest in other people. And we're not just going to invest in Canada. We want to invest all over the world. That's where we want to bring the Nishka Nation. And so one of the other things that we learned when we were in Colorado is that there is a big concern from the investment companies on the EOA process of British Columbia. That's what gets talked about with investors, which could be a huge problem in bringing investment into British Columbia. And we need to have that discussion as well. 
if we want to be able to move forward and build legacies for ourselves, not just for Indigenous communities, but for BC as a whole in working with the non-Indigenous communities. We need to both understand that. So as we uh, move forward in all aspects of what we do as Indigenous communities, because a lot of times legislation is based on foreign companies coming into BC and when an indigenous, commun indigenous community wants to be the proponent, it's a really tough challenge because legislation doesn't support that, doesn't support indigenous people when they want to be the proponent. And we're finding that out firsthand. Ourselves not just with mining, we also help uh, mining company within our nation get a huge investment so they could finish their construction. If we weren't there with them, they may not have gotten it because we bring certainty to any development on our lands. And that's really important. And we need BC to see what we offer. They don't see that a lot of times. And it's important for the non-Indigenous community to communicate that out. We can't be fighting with our own government when we want to be the developers of companies on our lands. And so that's why it's so important for me to participate in what we're trying to do, especially the work that we've been doing with um, Peter and Kendra, trying to attract people to British Columbia and also building our own capacity within the area of mining because there's a space open and Nishka wants to fill that. And we're doing whatever we can to make sure going into our schools, educating our children, telling them there's a future outside of school in these areas and we're starting to get interest from our younger children who are planning on going in for geology and things like that and other parts like accounting to be able to do accounting for a company or even managing the mining companies. So that's where we're going. But to each of you, we need your support and to speak with us when we talk with the government to support what we're trying to do. And we need to really get on them on the environmental process. They have legislation, but no regulations to regulate it, and we need to get on them for that. So that's all I have. Thank you, and I'll leave the rest of the time to Christy. <laughs> <laughs> Dave. Well said. Gaila uh, Isla. Um, I just wanted to shout out as well that I'm very privileged to be on this stage again with colleagues that I've been presenting with over the last 20, 25 years of my career. Um, I actually spoke on this stage 13 years ago um, talking about the economic benefits of Mount Milligan and the benefits to Indigenous communities. And at that time, I would never believe I'd be sitting on a panel talking about positive legacy. Like, it was something at that time where I wasn't sure where the province of BC was headed with respect to the Indigenous relations that we had. And so I think just reflecting on all the comments, and I'll, I'll keep it a little bit shorter, um, I think it's really important to understand what legacy means to each individual, to each community, to each area of the province, because while we have really great success in some areas, other areas are just beginning the discussion of how to incorporate Indigenous interests and the perception of legacy to a project and other aspects. Um, uh, so I think we just have to uh, also reflect that there's definition of legacy that could be totally different. Um, and that's all I'm gonna say. I'm gonna pass it to you because I know you have a ton of questions that you're gonna ask us. I do. Thank you. Thanks, panelists. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to start my questions with you, Christy, and it's, this is, so this is a, a plug and a question. So you wrote a fantastic and very helpful book with Michael McPhee entitled Weaving Two Worlds. 
And um, in it, you challenge the reader to undertake self-reflection and educate themselves on the history of indigenous peoples. And I think given our topic here, um, I'd just like you to take a moment and just, if you can, sum those recommendations for our audience, particularly for our industry members. Okay. <laughs> I know that's a big ask. But. That's okay. Um, I think if you were to actually just read one portion of the book, <laughs> I would read chapter one in respect to self-reflection. I think the biggest fault that we see, and this goes across the board and across Canada and also globally, is that we come to the table without recognizing our own ego, our own bias, our own assumptions that we come to the table with. And so it's really, really difficult to have conversations about Indigenous interests, about um, not the project, about building relationships, um, all those really, really important fundamental pieces, the starting pieces, without understanding your own self. And so I think for me, um, that's how I've seen tables go sideways, upside down, out the door, people kicked out. I just recently watched uh, um, one of my relations kick somebody right out of the boardroom because they just wanted to talk about the project and they weren't very interested in understanding how to build the relationship. So those things still happen. Um, are we doing better? Yes. Uh, is there a lot of work to do? Absolutely. And it really boils down to understanding history, education, absolutely, but understanding how you as a person enter into the relationship with the Indigenous community um, and, and vice versa. I mean, I, I represent my community um, personally on behalf of my community for mining projects as well. And we also do a check of what we want in a relationship. We know that um, sometimes there's um, conversations and really hard conversations that need to be had and we have to set that stage without assuming that there's this outcome right here that's gonna happen. So I just wanted to say that if you were gonna do anything, it's about self-reflection and uh, in investing true-heartedly. If you lead with the heart, as my colleagues do, you're gonna be successful. Um, if you lead with schedule and budget and all those things that are impacting you, and don't get me wrong, those are really, really important, but if you lead with those and not the relationship and not with uh, being human, then your project's in trouble. Thank you, Christy. Awesome. Um, weaving two worlds, get it on Amazon. Um, Peter, let's start your exit interview now. No. Um, you have kind of reflected. It's really dangerous. <laughs> reflected on the changes you've seen. I think you put that forward quite ably at the outset. Um, but from your perspective, like what, and you've seen a lot, and you, I mean, you've spent most of your career working in mining and, and in indigenous relations and bringing people together. Um, what does the Declaration Act mean for the BC mining industry and indigenous peoples? Like, where, where do you think we're gonna be in 10 years? I think folks described it right here. We're gonna have indigenous mine owners, indigenous mine investors, and, and I, I'd say the Declaration Act is catching up to where mining was going. Like, you couldn't build a mine without consent, call it whatever you want, for a long time. It's an unpermittable if you showed up with trying to tag on nations at the end of a process. So I, I think that the mining industry, the reason why it was chosen to be the first Section 7 and was because they were already there. It wasn't a huge shift for them to get there. It wasn't like, oh my God, I can't, we're gonna do what? You know, they were, they were just ready for it. And so I think it was from all the hard work that, and the hard work is really what Christy said, like you have to just show up 
and be honest and have those conversations and be in community and and not be and not be adding things on it is a co-development and, and like that's where we're going is what was described right here by both Nishka and Taltan and I, and I think Christy does make a good point of there are lots of nations and we're very diverse in British Columbia. that's a fantastic part of being here but everybody's at a different stage on that journey and and some people might not be as supportive of mining and those are the hard conversations you have to have early and I think government left that gap we did a lot of land use planning in the province and didn't involve indigenous communities again they were sort of tagged on to the end and those are some of the honest conversations we're going to have around land use planning and sort of co-planning what what territories look like and then i think it is going to free up a lot bigger conversations around major projects when you can release some of that tension and sort of get some of that space understood um, i think that's a big step that the declaration act is going to lead to all of the alignment of laws and all of the hard, lots of hard work, like the Mineral Tenure Act reform that we've committed to under the Declaration Act, that's all gonna be hard. But I, I think it's doing that journey together and, and slowing down to make sure you get it right. We, we could rush to change a bunch of things and have everybody stressed out, um, but I think you, what the logical way to do it is, is sit down with everybody in the room um, be honest, be true to yourself of what the outcome you're hoping for is. And then there's a ton of smart people on all sides to figure it out. We'll get through it, Michael. I, I'm confident we'll figure it out. I'm confident the Declaration Act, when you read it, seems like there's a lot of things in there that are gonna be different. Absolutely. But it's just this incremental piece and the movement has really happened. Like I said last night, I think the water's out of the glass now and it, 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 there's no containing. So. Let's enjoy it. Let's really push and make those changes happen. And the future is this blurred line of, of the who, and we're all going to be working on the outcomes we want. Um, and I think we've seen it with Skeena and taking ownership and the consent and all those pieces. It, it doesn't seem like a huge... Sh we, we talk about it a lot because um, it's announceable, but it seems like what we've been doing for a while. So. Uh, I'm confident in where we're going. I'm confident we have great leaders. I've had fantastic mentors uh, on the Indigenous relations side of things. Um, lots of Treaty 8 talk up here the last couple of days. You know, and I look at Soto as a real leader in the mining engagement sector for me. Uh, they've really taken me in and sort of let me see how their community makes decisions in those pieces. So I think just listen and spend time and it'll all work. We're going we're gonna to get there. And mining has huge space. Like, I know the forest sector is going through a tough time. There's lots of space for mining to grow right now. So, Thanks, Peter. And, um, yeah, we will uh, we'll miss you in the mining sector, but you know you're not far. Um, Nalene. So, yeah, I mean, you bring deep experience, and, and, and now you're wearing a new hat working with Skeena Resources. Um, you, you also, I think, have a, a good, given your, your, your roles and experience, a good understanding of kind of the capacity um, of nations um, and what they need to kind of work uh, on a, you know, towards a mining project. So what do you think uh, the province can do to ensure that nations can be on an equitable footing uh, in terms of their governance and administrative capacity as we enter into this era of shared decision making. Because not all nations have the capacity right now. They want to have it, they aspire to it. They might have a project to whom they're talking to. What, what do we do and does the Crown have a role in that? So, thank you, Kendra. Sorry, I just had to do that. Anyway, Michael. Um, I think that the province should continue on the path that they're on. Um, and when I say that, I know there might be a few folks that are going, no, no. But anyway, when I say that, you know, I'm thinking about all of the things, that all of the various initiatives that are taking place, right? So, you know, we've gone beyond just that initial sort of checkbox engagement to uh, resource revenue sharing, 
right, to co-management agreements, to strategic agreements with the province. And some have inherent built-in co-management principles like the Red Chris Management Agreement, right? Within like the environmental assessment process, there is of course um, provisions to provide capacity to nations. Um, and I don't know if any of my EAO colleagues are here, but it's, it's still not enough. I'll, I'll put that out there. Um, and I know that, you know, with the various other agencies on permittings, uh, on permits, there is uh, efforts to do the same. But that conversation about the need for permitting needs to be opened up and additional detail and consideration needs to go into that. Um, the last point I'll make, I, recognizing we're running out of time, uh, is the work that's happened around Indigenous knowledge, right? And when you look at all of the environmental legislation, we note that there is more than just consideration for an Indigenous knowledge in these applications today. And, you know, I'm quite proud of that fact. Um, coming from an Indigenous nation, I know that the Taltan have extensive understanding and history about their landscape as I'm sure other nations are the same way, right? So when considering impacts on the land, you know, this information, this valuable knowledge must play a role in that. So thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, Charles, we talked a bit yesterday afternoon about capacity building um, and some of your plans and where you see your nation going. Um, can you reflect on, on Naleen's comments? You know, how you guys have got some big plans. Um, and where do you see your nation in 10, 20 years? Well, to begin, I'll answer the easiest question where we see the Nishka Nation in 20 years. We see the Nishka Nation owning the mine. And I think uh, one of the things that we, and also learning from the Taltan and because uh, there's always been a relationship between the Taltan and the Nishka, like from way back from a peace treaty that we signed with them and then uh, empowering that peace treaty with a memorandum of understanding for us to work together and especially because of these opportunities that we're having right now in the mining industry. And so I, I think uh, like we need to like look at the overall picture of what is available, what do we have and what can we build on and beginning that in our schools is most important. And maybe realigning our school curriculum to uh, be done in a way that uh, pro that we see the opportunities that are there for our children in the future. Before there used to be, we used to be geared towards getting really high level education and um, things like uh, being lawyers, doctors and, and uh, accountants and things like that. But there's a bigger picture now that we're going more to industry and we need to try to shift where we're going and getting all our younger people interested in all these different uh, employment opportunities in the industry because it's huge. And before, like forestry uh, was the big uh, driver for the economy in BC. And a lot of resources come from Northern BC and we're, we're the least to benefit from it. So now we, we see an opportunity for our younger people to play a bigger part in that and knowing what there is for them and helping guide them to that area. And we have a really good person in our Nishka Nation that's really pushing that right now. And his name's Andrew Robinson. And I think anybody who really wants to uh, really know where we're going, uh, speak to him and because he'll, he'll tell you everything and he, he won't sugarcoat nothing. And, and so, so we're, we'll, we'll see what 
what there is for us and we'll push our schools to maybe change the curriculum to allow our people to advance in, in those areas and we don't have much time so I'll end there. Thank you, Charles. So you're, you're, you're preparing and building the legacy of tomorrow, today. Right on. Um, we just have just under five minutes. Um, there was a couple of questions that were definitely good to touch on. Um, this is an interesting one, and I'll just open it up to you guys, and maybe if you have some names that come up. Someone asked, they said, we heard from the panel about important legacy work to bring all players into a better functioning relationship between industry and First Nations. I would be curious to know who were some of these early movers and what role they played. Do you guys have some mentors or leaders that come to your mind um, that you'd want to share? One of them is sitting right here for the early movers and shakers. But, but I would also say the late John Jules for me was from the Kamloops. And what he did was, so we do like chance find for archeology span and every company back in that time was like, why the hell do we have to do this? Like we never find anything. It's just a process step. And they found a historic site. They, they found a site that was very, very, very meaningful to their community. and. He came down to Victoria and presented in front of 300 people in front of my ministry and came down and presented. He said, this is why you do it. And he just stood up and made, made he, has an he had an incredible laugh where he could really just like belly laugh and take a really uncomfortable, and then the next sentence he's like right on you about something really critical. And he, he had the whole audience like dead silent, you know, a bunch of geologists, a bunch of engineers, a bunch of policy people, and he really left the room with, oh my God, that's why we do it. And it made that connection of a little step that everybody was frustrated with in the mining sector that you had to do. It's a hunting blind they found, you know, from a couple thousand years ago, really important in a pinch point between two hills. And it, it's, to me, that, that was an early conversation. There's lots of people, but that one really jumps to mind for me. And he was a fantastic friend and an individual. Billy? So, um a fellow that I work quite closely with and have for a number of years, uh, who I would certainly consider a mentor, and has been a quiet behind the scenes force, uh, I think would be Rob McPhee. So I'd like to mention him here as well. Right on. Charles? Yeah, I wanna, like mine's gonna come from a different perspective and it comes from when Amax is mining in the area and one of the biggest influencers for me in responsible development is our, our late president, James Gosnell. And my uh, late grandfather, because they had the foresight to see that if you're not there, to be responsible in development that it could be harmful for for our, especially our, our nation at the time because of where they were dumping the tailings at that time in the, in the waters where we get our food. So they've been big influencers for myself um, on how we talk and have a bigger say in the industry because we had no say then. People were allowed to do whatever they wanted in our territories. So I would have to say <clears throat> they were my influencers. Thank you, Charles. Thanks for sharing that. Christy? Yeah, um, well, I'd like to say there's a lot of people in the audience that are shaker movers, and I've been in my career for 25 years and alongside of a lot of those shaker movers. Um, Maylene has been a big part of me uh, pursuing and continuing to pursue when I wanted to quit mining. <laughs> Um, but I also think it comes back to family and home. Um, I've been challenged to challenge, challenged to ask questions and challenged to break through things that don't seem right or need questioning. And so a lot of that goes back to where I come from and my ancestors and my roots, so. Thank you. Um, we're here talking about legacy and yet we have to acknowledge, yeah, ancestors and people who have come before us and people in our lives today because uh, it's on their shoulders we stand, right? And try to build a, a positive 
and robust legacy for the generations to come. And I think through this whole resource forum and on this panel with respect to mining, we have so much potential in the industry um, through collaboration and partnership, right? We can um, reconcile and make lives better, right? Because that's what everybody wants. Everyone wants to have a good life, right? Doesn't matter who you are. Um, so, uh, what a great panel. Thank you very much, folks. Our time has come to an end. Um, I just heard, you know, what came to mind for me is through all this is the growing role of indigenous people in mining and other natural resource sectors, but in mining in particular for us here, it's a, the panel, um, and being part of the industry, not being bystanders, right? Um, so I'd like to thank our panelists, Christy, Charles, Nilene, Peter, um, some people on this panel who are going through some change or have had recent change. Um, Congrats, and uh, Peter, we wish you well on your new journey. Um, thank you for making the time for this panel and, um, and for sharing your perspectives with the audience. And I'd like to thank the C3 Alliance team. As always, you guys do a great job. And uh, thank our sponsor, the Prince George Hospice Society, again. Thanks, everybody.